Hi, welcome to I Educator. This is Teacher Jeff. I'm an educator and an engineer by profession. And today we will discuss chapter three. And chapter three is all about information systems, organization, and strategy. Now, in today's lesson, there are three key areas that I'm going to be discussing today. First, we have uh, the features of organizations that managers need to know about to build and use information systems successfully. Second, we will be discussing as well the impacts of information systems on organization. And finally, we will also be tackling about the Porter's Competitive Forces model, value chain models, synergies, core competencies, and network economics, which help companies develop competitive strategies using information system. Now, in order for us to get started, let us discuss now the first key area of our lesson that would be the features of organizations that managers need to know about to build and use information systems successfully. Now take note that information systems and organizations influence one another, correct? Having said that, information systems are built by managers to serve the interests of the business firm. At the same time, the organization must be aware of and open to the influences of information systems to benefit from new technologies. The interaction between information technology and organizations is complex and is influenced by many mediating factors, including the organization's structure, the business processes, the politics, culture, surrounding environment and management decisions as you can see in figure 3.1 now figure 3.1 presents the two-way relationship between organizations and information technology and in this case as an employee of the firm where you are currently working right now or if you are still a student then as a soon-to-be employee you will need to understand how information systems can change social and work life in our firm. Now take note, you will not be able to design new systems successfully or understanding existing systems without understanding your own business organizations, right? And so for that matter, once you become a manager, always remember that as a manager, you will be the one to decide which systems will be built, what they will do, and how they will be implemented. You may not be able to anticipate all of the consequences of these decisions. Some of the changes that occur in business firms because of new information technology investments cannot be foreseen and have results that may or may not meet your expectations. So who would have imagined 15 years ago, for instance, that email and instant messaging would become a dominant form of business communication and that many managers would be inundated with more than 200 email messages each day. Okay, now in order for us to better understand what an organization is, then let us first discuss our key subtopic, which is organization. So if we say organization, it is a stable, formal, or formal social structure that takes resources from the environment and processes them to produce output. And as you can see in figure 3.2, it shows the technical microeconomic definition of the organization. And as you can notice, this technical definition focuses on three elements of an organization. Capital and labor are primary production factors provided by the environment. The organization or the firm transforms these inputs into products and services in a production function. The products and services are then consumed by environments in return for supply inputs. An organization is more stable than an informal group, such as a group of friends 
that meets every Friday for lunch in terms of longevity and routineness. Organizations are formal legal entities with internal rules and procedures that must abide by laws. And therefore, organizations are also social structures because they are a collection of social elements. Much as a machine has a structure, a particular arrangement of valves, horns, shafts, and other parts. Now, this definition of organization is powerful and simple, but it is not very descriptive or even predictive of real-world organizations. So a more realistic behavioral definition of an organization is a collection of rights, privileges, obligations, and responsibilities delicately balanced over a period of time through conflict and conflict resolution. As you can see in figure 3.3, it shows the behavioral view of organizations, okay? Now, in this behavioral view of the firm, people who work in organizations actually develop customary ways of working. When I say customary ways of working, what I mean about that is that they gain attachments to existing relationships and they make arrangements with subordinates and superiors about how work will be done, the amount of work that will be done, and under what conditions work will be done. And take note that most of these arrangements and feelings are not discussed in any formal rulebook. Now, the question is, how do these definitions of organizations relate to information system then? All right. Well, a technical view of organizations encourages us to focus on how inputs are combined to create outputs when technology changes are introduced in the company. Now, the firm is seen as infinitely malleable with capital and labor substituting for each other quite easily. But the more realistic behavior definition of an organization suggests that building new information systems or rebuilding old ones involve much more than a technical rearrangement of machines or workers, that some information systems change the organizational balance of rights, privileges, obligations, responsibilities, and feelings that have been established over a long period of time. Now, changing these elements can take a very long time, be very disruptive, and requires more resources to support training and learning. Now, in order for us to better understand this, let me give you an example. For example, the length of time required to implement a new information system effectively is much longer than usually anticipated simply because there is a lag between implementing a technical system and teaching employees and managers how to use the system. Now, in this example, technological change requires changes in who owns and controls information, who has the right to access and update that information, and who makes decisions about whom, when and how. Now, this more complex view forces us to look at the way work is designed and procedures used to achieve outputs. All right. Now, the next key subtopic that we're going to be discussing today, that would be the features of organization. At this point, we have to bear in mind that all organizations, especially modern organizations, share certain characteristics. They are bureaucracies with clear-cut divisions of labor and specialization. Organizations actually arrange specialists in a hierarchy of authority in which everyone is accountable to someone and authority is limited to specific actions governed by abstract rules or procedures. Now, these rules create a system of impartial and universal decision-making. Organizations try to hire 
and promote employees on the basis of technical qualifications and professionalism, not personal connection. Now, as you can see, the organization is devoted to the principle of efficiency, which is maximizing output using limited inputs. Okay, so that's the principle of efficiency. And other features of organizations include routine business processes, organizational culture, organizational politics, organizational environments, organizational structure, and other organizational features or goals, constituencies, and leadership styles. All of these features affect the kind of information systems used by the organization. Now, in order for us to better understand each of these features of organizations, let us discuss them one by one, starting with routine business processes. Now, if we say about routine business processes here, we need to be reminded that all organizations, including business firms, become very efficient over time because individuals in the firm develop routines for producing goods and services. And if we say routines, they are sometimes called as standard operating procedures or the SOP. They are precise rules, procedures, and practices that have been developed to cope with virtually all expected situations. This means that as employees learn these routines, they become highly productive and efficient. And the firm is able to reduce its costs over time as efficiency increases. Now, in order for us to better understand what routines really mean, let me give you a sample scenario. For example, when you visit a doctor's office, receptionists have a well-developed set of routines for gathering basic information from you, correct? Now, nurses have a different set of routines as well for preparing you for an interview with a doctor. And the doctor has a well-developed set of routines for diagnosing you as well. Now, business processes, which we introduce in chapters one and two, are collections of such routines. All right, so those are routine businesses processes. Now, now moving on to the next feature of organization, that would be organizational politics. So what do we mean by organizational politics then? As you may know, People in organizations occupy different positions with different specialties, concerns, and perspectives, right? As a result, they naturally have divergent viewpoints about how resources, rewards, and punishments should be distributed. In fact, these differences matter to both managers and employees, and they result in political struggle for resources competition, and conflict within every organization. So if we say political resistance, it is one of the great difficulties of bringing about organizational change, especially the development of new information system. And having said that, we cannot deny the fact that virtually all large information systems investment by a firm that bring about significant changes in strategy, business objectives, business processes, and procedures become politically charged events, and managers who know how to work with the politics of an organization will be more successful than less skilled managers in implementing new information system. And another feature of the organization is what we call the organizational culture. And take note that all organizations have bedrock, unassailable, and questioned by the members assumptions that define their goals and products. So if we say organizational culture, this encompasses this set of assumptions about what products the organization should produce, how it should produce, where and for whom. Now, generally, these cultural assumptions are taken totally for granted and are rarely publicly announced or discussed. 
business processes, which is the actual way business firms produce value, are usually ensconced in the organization's culture. Now, in order for us to better understand what an organization culture, then let me give you an example. For example, you can see organizational culture at work by looking around your university or college. Some bedrock assumptions of university are that professors know more than students. The reason students attend college is to learn and classes follow a regular schedule. Therefore, we can say that organizational culture is a powerful unifying force that restrains political conflict and promotes common understanding, agreement on procedures, and common practices. If we all share the same basic cultural assumptions, agreement on other matters is more likely, right? Now, at the same time, organizational culture is a powerful restraint on change, especially technological change. Remember, most organizations will do almost anything to avoid making changes in basic assumptions. Any technological change that threatens commonly held cultural assumptions usually meets a great deal of resistance. However, there are times when the only sensible way for a firm to move forward is to employ a new technology that directly opposes an existing organizational culture. When this occurs, the technology is often stalled while the culture slowly adjusts. And the next feature of an organization is what we call organizational environments. If we say organizational environment, um, organizations reside in environments from which they draw resources and to which they supply goods and services. Organizations and environments have a reciprocal relationship. What I mean about organizations and environments have a reciprocal relationship is that, on the other hand, organizations are open to and dependent on the social and physical environment that surrounds them. Without financial and human resources, people willing to work reliably and consistently for a set wage or revenue from customers, organizations could not exist. On the other hand, Organizations must respond to legislative and other requirements imposed by government, as well as the actions of customers and competitors. And also, organizations can influence their environment. For example, business firms form alliances with other businesses to influence the political process. They advertise to influence customer acceptance of their product. Now, as you can see in figure 3.5, it illustrates the role of information systems in helping organizations perceive changes in their environments and also in helping organizations act on their environments. Information systems are key instruments for environmental scanning or helping managers identify external changes that might require an organizational response. Another feature of an organization, that would be organizational structure. Now take note that all organizations have a structure or shape, correct? So what I mean about having a structure or shape is that organization structure or shape depends on the size of the organization, whether it is a small scale, medium scale, or large scale organization. And aside from that, the organization structure or shape may also depend on the type of business they are in. If they are a manufacturing type of business, a merchandising type of business, or a service type of business. Now, as you can see in Table 3.2, it illustrates an example of an organization's structure. Now, you have their organizational type. So we have entrepreneurial structure, machine bureaucracy, divisionalized bureaucracy, professional bureaucracy, and adhocracy as well. 
each of these types have their own description and example. So in regards to entrepreneurial structure, it is a young, small firm in a fast-changing environment, and it has a simple structure and is managed by an entrepreneur serving as its single chief executive officer. And examples of entrepreneurial structure type of organization are those small startup businesses. Another example would be machine bureaucracy. Now, this is large bureaucracy existing in a slowly changing environment, producing standard products. It is dominated by a centralized management team and centralized decision making. And examples of this type of organization are mid-size manufacturing firm or medium scale organizations, okay? Now, this being said, the kind of information systems you find in a business firm and the nature of problems with these systems often reflects the type of organizational structure. For instance, in a professional bureaucracy such as a hospital, it is not unusual to find parallel patient record systems operated by the administration, another by doctors, and another by other professional staff such as nurses and social workers. In small entrepreneurial firms, you will often find poorly designed systems developed in a rush that often quickly outgrow their usefulness. On the other hand, in huge multi-divisional firms operating in hundreds of locations, you will often find there is not a single integrating information system, but instead each locale or each division has its own set of information system. Now, organizations have goals and use of different means to achieve them. And first goal, that would be some organizations have coercive goals, for example, prisons. Others have utilitarian goals, such as businesses. And still others have normative goals, such as universities, religious groups as well. On the other hand, Organizations also serve different groups or have different constituencies, some primarily benefiting their members, other benefiting clients, stakeholders, or the public. Now, the nature of leadership differs greatly from one organization to another, correct? Some organizations may be more democratic or authoritarian than others. Another way organizations differ is by the tasks they perform and the technology they use. Now, some organizations perform primarily routine tasks that can be reduced to formal rules that require little judgment, such as manufacturing auto parts, whereas others, such as consulting firms, work primarily with non-routine tasks. All right, so that ends our discussion on the first key area of our lesson. And the next key area that we're going to be discussing now, that would be the impacts of information systems on organizations. Now, take note that information systems have become integral, online, interactive tools, deeply involved in minute-to-minute -minute operations and decision-making of large organizations, right? In fact, over the past decades, information systems have fundamentally altered the economics of organizations and greatly increased the possibilities for organizing work. Theories and concepts from economics and sociology help us understand the changes brought about by information technology. At this point, let us discuss the economic impact of information systems on organization. Now, as you can see, from the point of view of economics, information technology changes both the relative costs of capital and the cost of information. So what do we mean by this? Uh, we mean about information systems technology can be viewed as a factor of production that can be substituted for traditional capital and labor. So as the cost of information technology decreases, it is substituted for labor, which historically has been a rising cost. 
And therefore, information technology sh should result in a decline in the number of middle managers and clerical workers as information technology substitutes for their labor. Another economic impact as the cost of information technology decreases, it also substitutes for other forms of capital, such as buildings and machinery, which remain relatively expensive. Hence, over time, we should expect managers to increase their investments in information technology because it's declining costs relative to other capital investments. And finally, information technology also affects the cost and quality of information and changes the economics of information. Now here, information technology helps firms contract in size because it can reduce transaction cost. What do we mean by transaction cost? If we say transaction cost, they are the costs incurred when a firm buys on the marketplace what it cannot make itself. So according to transaction cost theory, firms and individuals seek to economize on transaction costs much as they do on production costs. So using markets is expensive because of costs such as locating and communicating with distant suppliers, monitoring contract compliance, buying insurance, obtaining information on products, and so forth. Traditionally, firms have tried to reduce transaction costs through vertical integration or by getting bigger, hiring more employees, and buying their own suppliers and distributors as both General Motors and Ford used to do. And on another subtopic, organization and behavioral impacts, here, theories based on the sociology of complex organizations also provide some understanding about how and why firms change with the implementation of new information technology application. Now, as you can see, organizations and behavioral impacts include information technology flattens organization, post-industrial organizations, and understanding organizational resistance to change. Now, in order for us to better understand each of these organization and behavioral impacts, let us discuss them one by one, starting with IT flattens organization. Now, if you can notice in the past, large bureaucratic organizations, which primarily developed before the computer age, are often inefficient, slow to change, and less competitive than newly created organizations, right? Now, some of these large organizations have downsized, reducing the number of employees and the number of levels in their organizational hierarchies. And behavioral researchers have theorized as well that information technology facilitates flattening of hierarchies by broadening the distribution of information to empower lower level employees and increase management efficiencies. So as you can see in figure 3.6, it illustrates flattening of organizations, okay? Now, as you can notice, IT pushes decision-making rights lower in the organization because lower level employees receive the information they need to make decisions without supervision. Now, this empowerment is also possible because of higher educational levels among the workforce, which give employees the, the capabilities to make intelligent decisions. And because managers now receive so much more accurate information on time, they become much faster at making decisions so fewer managers are required. So therefore, management costs decline as a percentage of revenues and the hierarchy becomes much more efficient. On the other hand, for post-industrial organization, as you can see, post-industrial theories based more on history and sociology than economics also support the notion 
that IT should flatten hierarchies. In post-industrial societies, authority increasingly relies on knowledge and competence and not merely on formal positions. And so for that matter, hence, the shape of organizations flattens because professional workers tend to self-managing and decision-making should become more decentralized as knowledge and information become more widespread throughout the firm. And in understanding organizational resistance to change, remember that information systems inevitably become bound up in organizational politics because they influence access to a key resource, namely information, all right? So information systems can affect who does what to whom, when, where, and how in an organization. So many new information systems require changes in personal, individual routines that can be painful for those involved and require retraining and additional effort that may or may not be compensated. And because information systems potentially change an organization's structure, culture, business processes, and strategy, then there is often considerable resistance to them when they are introduced. Now, there are several ways to visualize organizational resistance. Research on organizational resistance to innovation suggests that four factors are paramount. First, the nature of the IT innovation. Second, the organization structure. Third, the culture of people in organization. And finally, the tasks affected by the innovation. So these are the four factors about organizational resistance to innovation, especially if your company will invest in a new information technology system. As you can see in figure 3.7, it illustrates the organizational resistance to information systems innovations. Here, changes in technology are absorbed, interpreted, deflected, and defeated by organizational task arrangements, structures, and people. Now, in this model, the only way to bring about change is to change the technology, tasks, structure and people simultaneously and other authors have spoken about the need to unfreeze organizations before introducing an innovation quickly implementing it and, and refreezing or institutionalizing the change all right so that ends our discussion on the second key area of our presentation and the next key area that we're going to be discussing right now, that would be the Porter's Competitive Forces. As you may know, in almost every industry you examine, you will find that some firms do better than most others. There's almost always a standout firm, right? Now, in the automotive industry, for example, Toyota is considered a superior performer. In pure online retail, Amazon is the leader. In offline retail, Walmart, the largest retailer on earth, is the leader. In online music, Apple's iTunes is considered the leader with more than 60% of the downloaded music market. And in the related industry of digital music players, the iPod is the leader. And in web search, Google is considered the leader. Now, firms that do better than others are said to have a competitive advantage over others. They either have access to special resources that others do not, or, or they are able to use commonly available resources more efficiently, usually because of superior knowledge and information assets. In any event, they do better in terms of revenue growth, profitability, or productivity growth or efficiency, all of which ultimately in the long run translate into higher stock market valuations than their competitors. But why do some firms do better than others? And how do they achieve competitive advantage? 
how can you analyze a business and identify its strategic advantages? How can you develop a strategic advantage for your own business? And how do information systems contribute to strategic advantages? Now, one answer to that question is Michael Porter's competitive forces model. So Porter's competitive forces model is the most widely used model for understanding competitive advantage. And this model provides a general view of the firm, its competitors, and the firm's environment. Now, as you can see in figure 3.8, it illustrates Porter's competitive versus model. And earlier in this chapter, we described the importance of a firm's environment and the dependence of firms on environments, correct? Now, having said that, Porter's model is all about the firm's general business environment. And in this model, five competitive forces shape the fate of the firm. We have the traditional competitors, the new market entrants, the substitute products and services, the customers, and finally, the suppliers. Now, in order for us to better understand each of these competitive forces model, let us discuss them one by one, starting with the traditional competitors. Now, for traditional competitors, all firms share market space with other competitors who are continuously devising new, more efficient ways to produce by introducing new products and services and attempting to attract customers by developing their brands and imposing switching costs on their customers. On the other hand, for new market entrants, take note that in a free economy with mobile labor and financial resources, new companies are always entering the marketplace, right? Now, in some industries, there are very low barriers to entry, whereas in other industries, entry is very difficult because it is blocked. For instance, it is fairly easy to start a pizza business or just about any small retail business, but it is much more expensive and difficult to enter the computer chip business, which has very high capital cost and requires significant expertise and knowledge that are hard to obtain. Now, new companies have several possible advantages. First, they are not locked into old plants and equipment. They often hire younger workers who are less expensive and perhaps more innovative. They are not encumbered by old worn out brand names and they are more hungry, meaning more highly motivated than traditional occupants of an industry. And these advantages are also their weakness, okay? They depend on outside financing for new plants and equipment, which can be expensive, and they have a less experienced workforce as well, and they have little brand recognition, okay? And on substitute products and services, in just about every industry, there are substitutes that your customers might use if your prices become too high, okay? So new technologies create new substitutes all the time. For example, ethanol can substitute for gasoline in cars. Another example would be vegetable oil for diesel fuel in trucks and wind, solar, coal, and hydropower for industrial electric generation. Likewise, internet and wireless telephone service can substitute for traditional telephone service, right? And of course, an internet music service that allows you to download music tracks to an iPod or a smartphone has become a substitute for CD-based music stores as well. Now, the more substitute products and services in your industry, the less you can control pricing and the lower your profit margins as well. And on the customer side, Take note that a profitable company depends in large measure on its ability to attract and retain customers while denying them to competitors and change high prices. Now, remember, the power of customers grows if they can easily switch to a competitor's products and services or if they can force a business and its competitors 
to compete on price alone in a transparent marketplace where there is little product differentiation and all prices are known instantly. For instance, in the used college textbook market on the internet, students or who happens to be the customers can find multiple suppliers of just about any current college textbook. So in this case, online customers have extraordinary power over used books firms. And finally, we have suppliers. Now here, the market power of suppliers can have a significant impact on firm profits, especially when the firm cannot raise prices as fast as can suppliers. So the more different suppliers a firm has, the greater control it can exercise over suppliers in terms of price, quality, and delivery schedules. For instance, manufacturers of laptop PCs almost always have multiple competing multiple competing suppliers of key components such as keyboards, hard drives, and display screens, okay? So this is all about Porter's competitive force model. So if you wish your business would like to gain competitive advantage, then you can employ Porter's competitive forces model. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. If you have questions, please let me know in the comment section below. And if you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button for the latest updates. Thank you.